Well, hey there, and thanks for joining me once again. Or thanks for joining me if this is the first of my videos you've watched. Anyway, I thought I'd take a break from my most recent series of videos to lace in a few sample chapters from my latest book, Herald of the Death God, which hopefully should be out in August. Hopefully. I have hit a few snags. Uh, in the editing process, I've discovered a few plot holes here and there and, and some areas that just had quite frankly, some shoddy writing in it, but I'm getting to the point where I think it's just about ready to be released. Anyway, um, so this book, it's a collection of sword and sorcery short stories and acts as a, com as a companion to my first book, Hand of the Death God. However, if you haven't read any of the stories from that book, don't, don't sweat it, don't worry about it. Um, every story, every short story in this book is designed so that it can be read by itself without any outside or previous knowledge of the characters or the setting. Uh, that being said, if you are one of those, those sick masochists who have actually read or listened to some of my previous stories and are coming back for more, well, um, it should help paint a, a little big, a little bit of a, a bigger picture of the world that I've kind of created and give you a little bit more information about, you know, the, the people and the places in it and that sort of thing. Well, I guess that's about it. Um, this story is The Catacombs of Insanity. Great title, huh? Um, I don't think there's a whole lot that I really need to explain about this. It, it pretty much takes care of itself. There are a few plot twists that I hope you like. And uh, I should mention that this story is actually inspired by one of Stephen King's uh, novels, surprisingly enough. So if you're a King fan, uh, see if you can guess which story was the inspiration for this. You might be a little bit surprised. And what else? You get to hear me talk like a woman in this one. So uh, if you don't find the storytelling very compelling, well, hopefully you can at least be amused by my cringeworthy voice acting. I guess that's about it. Um, thanks once again for listening. You're the best. The Catacombs of Insanity Vendar took a swig from his drinking jack. As the cheap ale chased the piece of fatty beef down his gullet, a trace of movement out of the corner of his keen eye caught his attention. He paused, drinking jack in hand, as he observed a rat brazenly scooting a morsel of food across the table. Damn it, Cyrix! Vendar jerked away from the table, causing the mismatched dinnerware to clatter noisily. What kind of place are you running here? There's a rat on my table. The tavern owner, a squat, sweaty man with a bald head and a scarred eye, rushed over to the table, broom in hand. Terribly sorry, terribly sorry, he said in a strained, raspy voice. Came a shout from a table across the room. That's the second one this week, Cyrix. You gotta keep this place clean. Cyrix swatted at the rat with his broom. The rodent, too nimble to be caught by the proprietor's half-hearted assault, dropped off the table and scurried into the corner, where it melted away into the shadows. I try to keep this place in good shape, but you know, sometimes these beasties sneak in. It's an unavoidable part of the business, the owner apologized to the customer. Cyrix, we both know this place isn't a symposium hall, said Vendar. I come here because it's cheap, but this is the third time in the past month you've had vermin problems. Insects? Rats? What kind of place are you running here? Cyrix glanced left, then right, then back at the well-muscled, ruggedly handsome patron. <sighs> Follow me, he said with a sigh. The tavern owner led Vendar through a wooden door, releasing a small group of perturbed bats as he did, then, by lamplight, down a set of stone stairs and into the dark cellar below. In the light of the flickering lamp, Vendar could see a variety of crates, jars, and casks set in a curious, elongated compartments built into the sides of the walls. He had never seen a cellar quite like it, but there was something about its construction that seemed oddly familiar. Suddenly, movement along the floor caught his attention. Directing his gaze downward, he noticed that, among the supplies and sundries, mice and roaches could be seen milling about. Meanwhile, bats stretched their wings on the low ceiling above. "'Gods!' exclaimed Vendar as he noticed the vermin. "'Why are you showing this to me?' "'Vendar, you've been a good customer for many years now, and you deserve my honesty.' 
I've got an infestation. I don't know what's causing it. I've been making sure to keep the place clean to remove any traces of stray food or drink. I've even tried consulting apothecaries to find reagents that'll repel vermin, but nothing seems to work. If I can't fix this problem soon, I'm going to lose my business. Vendar had a keen mind for opportunity and was quick to recognize any situation where he could potentially benefit. Immediately, an idea sprang to his mind. What if I found a way to solve your problem? He said, I doubt you could. Do you have any experience with this sort of thing? Absolutely none, admitted Vendar, but that's never stopped me before. You know I have a way of making things work out. Cyric snorted with irony. <laughs> Vendar, if you can find a way to fix my problem, I'll give you free beer for a lifetime. Is that a deal? Vendar thrust out his hand. Cyrix regarded the open palm, then looked up at its owner's roguish sideways smile. Back down at the hand, then back at Vendar's grinning face. Cyrix threw caution to the wind, grasping the palm in a firm contractual handshake. It's a deal. With that, Vendar turned about and immediately set off up the stairs. As he left, Cyrix wondered how the adventurer could possibly solve his infestation, little knowing that Vendar, despite his confident pace, was thinking the same. Vendar crouched in the firelight beside his cot, thinking, how could he rid Cyrix of his vermin problem? He had no idea, and when he had no idea, the next step of the process was to seek help from someone who did. Cyrix had already sought the help of conventional experts, which meant Vendar had to seek the aid of unconventional experts. But who? There was Radulus, the old merchant who some believed dealt with dark powers to attain his own ends, but those were only rumors and black magic made Vendar nervous anyway. There was Ajin, the assassin, who was a master of various poisons for man and beast alike, but he didn't owe Vendar any favors, and Vendar certainly didn't want to owe any favors to Ajin. There was also Akmotesh, the foreign priest of Anubis, who wielded the power of life and death. But he was powerful indeed, and Vendar, while brash, certainly wasn't foolish enough to risk insulting the mysterious cleric by asking him to get rid of rats. What Vendar needed was someone who had mastery over animals, a druid perhaps, or, of course, Argonus. Argonus was a priestess of Sebele, the mother goddess of fertility and natural life. Vendar and his associates had done a great service to the cult of Sebele, and most likely the entire region, when they had thwarted the plans of the followers of Ereshkigal, who had been bent on corrupting the surrounding hinterlands with the taint of death. If anyone could get a bunch of rodents and bugs to leave Cyrix's place, surely it was she. Tracking Argonus down was difficult. The cult of Sebele was highly decentralized. Some would even call it disorganized. As such, there was no church or temple where she could be found carrying out daily tasks or services. Rather, Argonus's temple was the wilderness itself, among the forests and plains. It was a dangerous place to be in those days, with its savage beasts, monsters, and cannibal proto-humans, yet Argonus was accustomed to it. The powers of her goddess made her not only a skilled nurturer, but a dangerous combatant as well. At length, Vendar tracked Argonus to a small hut that was barely visible among the tangle of creepers and ivies that covered its surface. Within, he stood face to face with the priestess, among sprawling potted herbs, bird cages, and kettles of simmering brews. Of course I remember you, brave one. The earth speaks your name in gratitude, said Argonus, arrayed in garlands of flowers and scant robes of billowy silk as she finished tending her herbs. I've come to ask a favor of you. Argonus nodded sincerely. Very well. After your valorous acts against the cult of Ereshkigal, you're certainly entitled to aid from the disciples of Sebele. What is it you seek? Vendor explained the nature of his deal with Cyrix. Argonus listened intently, all the while keeping her visitor fixed in a stern gaze. When Vendor had finished, Argonus said flatly, So you've come to ask me to talk to some rats so you can get free beer. Well, when you put it that way, it sounds kind of... silly. Who do you think I am? Some sort of charlatan who uses ledger domain to con people out of their money? <sighs> just because the worshippers of Sibylle don't have a big corrupt church like the cult of Aeus doesn't mean we're all just a bunch of savage shamans. Argonus punctuated her tirade by casting a wispy silk scarf at Vendar. Uh, I didn't mean it that way, Vendar said, taking the scarf in his hand. I just thought you'd be willing to help out a good friend. The powers given me by the goddess are not to be squandered on Wastrelsi. It seemed to the adventurer that he had lost his chance. It was time to throw caution to the wind. He launched one final last-ditch risky gambit to acquire the priestess's help. Come on, 
Doesn't that night we spent together before we raided the Church of Bones mean anything to you? He touched her lightly on the shoulder as he gave a sincere and piercing gaze with his brilliant gray eyes. Of course not, Argona said as she gazed back. Her words were strong, but her tone was weak. That was simply a ritual to call upon the aid of the goddess. At last, Vendar had found a crack in the wall. Now it was time to put hammer and chisel to the crack and bring the whole structure tumbling down. Was it? he said, raising his hand to her cheek as a look of hurt softened his rugged face. Okay, so now what? Argona said, ducking a low-flying bat as she and Vendar stood in the dank gloom of Cyrix's cellar. Well, I kind of thought that was up to you to figure out. <laughs> I mean, that was why I brought you here. Argona shot a look of pure exasperation at Vendar. Can't you, I don't know, talk to the rats or something? Ask them why they're infesting Cyrix's place? I can't talk to animals. Well, I don't know, can't you wave your arms around and ask Mother Earth and Sister Moon for guidance, that sort of thing? By the gods, you're daft. You actually think priestesses of Sibylle can talk to animals? What would they say? Well, met Argonus, your hair is beautiful. I've seen you communicate with animals before, Vendar said defensively. I can sometimes sense their emotions. Animals don't have human intellects. Therefore, they are ruled solely by instincts and feelings. I can tap into those instincts to deduce a creature's intent. Like I said, you can talk to animals. It's not the same. Okay, well, in any case, how about using that trick on our furry little friends here to find out what they're thinking or feeling? I can do that, Argonus agreed. She bent toward the ground, placing a hand out before her as she fixed her eyes on one of the rats wandering about the cellar. Just like that, the beast stopped its busy work and lifted its snout into the air inquiringly. After a few minutes of sniffing and whisker twitching, the creature began to make its way over to the crouching priestess. Vendar watched with amazement. He had no idea how she did it, but he knew now was not the time to open his mouth and ask. At length, the rodent made its way over to the woman, who gathered it into her hands and began to gently caress it. Vendar couldn't help but feel a degree of revulsion at this. There was no telling what sort of filth pits that creature had been wallowing in, but Argonus definitely knew more than he about the natural world. The priestess stayed this way for several minutes, gazing at the rat, watching every subtle gesture of its body, feeling the pulse of its life essence, tapping into the mutual bond that they, as fellow creatures of nature, shared. I sense fear, she said at length, looking back up to Vendar. Well, that makes sense. There must be hundreds of things out there that want to kill a rat. Snakes, cats, Cyrix. No, this is different. It's a special fear, a primal fear, a deep-seated fear all natural creatures, including humans, have of the unnatural. The unnatural? Creatures that exist in defiance to the laws of nature, or exist outside them. Demons and the undead. What do you think it means? I think the reason all these animals are inhabiting Cyrix's building is because they're fleeing from something. But what? I'm unable to comprehend that from the rat's emotions. It's likely the rat doesn't know himself, only that it's something that doesn't belong in this world. Well, can you find out how they're getting into Cyrix's cellar? Argonus thought for a moment. I could sense from which direction the source of the rat's distress lies, she said. Then let's do it. Again, the priestess focused on the rodent. Behind that wall, she said after a few seconds of concentration. This one over here, Vendar said, walking over to an end of the cellar against which were stacked several wooden casks. Argonus nodded. Vendar searched the wall, squatting low as he moved his lamp across it. Soon he came across a small fissure. He got on his hands and knees and held his flame to the aperture as he gazed in. <sighs> It looks like there's a chamber behind the wall, he said with a grunt as he stood back up, like it's completely hollow. So now what? Well, unless you can turn into a rat, we'll have to get Cyrix's permission to break it down. Any progress? Cyrix asked as Vendar returned. Maybe. The priestess thinks they might be fleeing from something. They seem to be coming from behind the far wall of the cellar. I found a crack that seems to lead to a hollow region beyond, but to access it, I'll need to bust up the wall. You're not hiding anything down there, are you, Cyrix? Vendar added. Cyrix put down the flag and he was wiping. What? No, I... The publican took a moment to reconsider. But you know, this building wasn't originally mine. I don't know who had it before me. But now that you mention it, the masonry on that wall is a bit different from the others. Like it's been added more recently. Can I bust it down? 
Cyric stroked his chin. Yeah, yeah, let's bust her down. I don't like to think about the repair costs, but I'm as curious now as I am eager to get to the source of my infestation. Let's get to work. Vendar wiped his brow as he leaned on his hammer. A pile of rubble lay at his feet, and a man-sized hole in the cellar wall of Cyrix's public house yawned before him. After a few moments of rest, he stepped through with Cyrix and Argonis to his rear. Beyond the wall lay a chamber hewed from stone. A dank and musty charnel house reek filled the air, and mice and insects scurried past the feet of the intruders as they stepped inside. The glow of Vendar's torch illuminated a ghastly sight. There, along the walls, were stone shelves and alcoves upon which lay skeletons and bones. The flesh long ago rotted away. "'We're in the city catacombs!' Vendar exclaimed. "'They usually run pretty deep beneath the city, but there are places where they come close to the surface. But I wonder how—' "'Wait a minute!' Vendar pushed past his companions, making his way back to the hole in the wall. He thrust his head out, looked to and fro, then came back in, regarding the chamber with greater scrutiny. He repeated this gesture one more time before exclaiming with sudden horror, Cyrix, you said you didn't know the history of your building, right? The proprietor nodded. Well, look at the shelves in here, and then look at the shelves of your cellar. Cyrix did as instructed, at which point he clapped his hands to his bald pate and snarled, By the Prince of Thieves, I knew the price of this place was too low. Ah, uh, never make a deal with an Easterner. Argonus was confused. What are the two of you talking about? Argonus, Vendar said, taking her by the shoulder, look at the shelves and stone of the two chambers. Argonus dead as instructed, then, when she still didn't comprehend, Vendar explained, they're exactly the same. Cyrix's cellar used to be a part of the catacombs. At some point, someone must have walled it up and constructed a building over it. God, I'm surprised the place isn't cursed, Cyrix snarled. Well, let's see what other secrets are hiding down here, said Vendar, hitching up his girdle as he strode forth. You go ahead and tell me what you find, Cyrix said. You volunteered to take on this job. And curious as I am to get to the bottom of this, I've got a business to run, and skulking in the catacombs is the last thing I want to do at this point. <laughs> You're not scared of a few moldy skeletons, are you, Cyrix? Vendar chided. Yes, the tavern keeper said vehemently before turning back toward the stairs. If you're not back by midnight, I'll send someone after you, he called back. What about you, Vendar said to Argonus. I know you're curious to see what it is that has these rats and bats so spooked. I am, the priestess replied without a trace of hesitance in her voice. Things down here are not acting in accordance with the laws of nature, and such circumstances almost always spiral out of control unless they're stopped. Let us move onward. <laughs>